Today we will hear from current members of the Cum Laude Society about their pursuits of these qualities and the lessons they have learned on their journeys toward success. Their stories are much more valuable than any words I have to say. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Melissa Altman. Horseback riding, piano, soccer, basketball, tennis, art lessons, you name it, I did it. For a while, I intensely pursued each of these activities, but none held my interest for more than a few months. After a predictable amount of time, usually a year or two, I abandoned each of these pursuits in search of bigger and better things. My pattern of quitting persisted until the fifth grade. Before starting GDS beginning band class, my mom and I met with Mr. Mintz to choose an instrument. While experimenting with an array of choices, I was immediately enchanted by the unique brass instrument that was almost as large as me, the trombone. So, like dozens of times before, in fifth grade, I decided that playing the trombone would be my new endeavor. Following my typical pattern, I delved into my newfound interest. However, breaking my pattern, for some reason, the trombone stuck with me. Nine years later, I am still as committed to the trombone as I was that fateful day in fifth grade. To this day, I still take advantage of every opportunity to advance my musical abilities and love doing so. As ironic as the statement may seem, my childhood as a chronic quitter is the reason I am now so devoted to music. Trying and then quitting activities for which I had little more than fleeting interest enabled me to find my true passion, trombone. I could have stuck with rock climbing or gymnastics or soccer but they would have added less meaning and enjoyment to my life than playing the trombone does. Don't get me wrong, I am not recommending that you quit every endeavor you attempt. Just refuse to settle for activities that don't enrich your life or that you do only for a college application. Be willing to explore a wide range of interests until you find ones that click. After all, who knows what will be your trombone? Thank you. Our next student speaker, Connor Dean. When leaning back in a chair, there's only so far you can go before you start to tip over. We've all had that feeling of teetering on the edge in the rush you get when faced with the fear of falling. But yet, we choose to lean back anyway. We understand the risk, yet we choose to take it. We dance with danger for no other reason than that we can. But when we're faced with a real decision, not a trivial challenge, most will err on the side of caution. They won't lean back. They're afraid of falling. But for some reason, the same mindset doesn't apply to the chair. Why? Is it because the stakes are higher? Maybe, but isn't that the point, to take a risk in the face of danger? I took a risk this year by deciding to double or even triple up on extracurriculars by participating in the play as well as, well as being a part of our swim and tennis teams. While I may have enjoyed each of these individually, when taken as a whole, well, let's just say my only free time came after 10.30 p.m. But yet, I still took the risk to extend myself past my typical schedule. I borrowed free time that I would have spent sleeping, to the chagrin of some of my teachers. But in the end, I had more to show for my senior year spring semester than any other semester so far in my GDS career. I teetered on the edge of my comfort zone. I worked hard. I found trouble along the way, but I took risks that paid off in the end. When you lean back in the chair, you have to push with your legs. That's what I challenge you to do. Push yourself back. Feel yourself on the edge. It's scary, I admit it. But when you're there, feeling yourself on the teetering edge of the back legs of a chair, you know that you've pushed yourself to your limit. Take the chance to take chances. Choose to dive into danger. The opportunities to do so will stick around for long. Thank you. Thank you. 
introduce Allison Tice. It was a sunny winter's day just a few months ago, and I was getting cabin fever. So some friends and I decided to take a day trip to Hanging Rock State Park. Now I bet many of you have done the same thing before and are very familiar with the leisurely 45 minute walk to the top of the mountain. Well on this day, we decided that we were tired of the same old walk. We began hiking and soon saw some rocks off the side of the trail. Ignoring the please stay on trail signs, we stepped off and investigated the scene further. About 10 minutes later, we found ourselves well off the trail and not really sure where to go from there. We began walking through the woods with no trace of a path. We climbed a few rock faces and finally, after about five hours of extensive hiking, we found ourselves at the top of Hanging Rock. We sat at the top of the mountain, out of breath and covered in dirt, laughing about how we could have been there over four hours ago. We sat for a little while longer, then decided to walk down the trail with all the other amateur hikers. As the park was closing in an hour, we would have no time for another adventure like we had just taken. On the way home, I began thinking a little more about the day and realized that it was the most fun I had ever had hiking at Hanging Rock. I had been numerous times before, but always out of habit and following others, taken the clearly marked 45-minute gravel pathway to the top. This time is different. More challenging, but more importantly, it was an experience set apart from others, and a memory I clearly will not forget as I'm writing a speech about it. Now, it's probably obvious what I want you to take away from this experience, but if you haven't caught on yet, be different. Take the harder, less traveled paths in life. It may be more difficult, but in the end, it will be worth it, and the experiences like these will be what you remember. So step out of your comfort zone, Take a chance and don't be afraid to do something different than everyone around you. Because you'll probably never get opportunities like these again. And who knows what decisions you will make or paths you will take that will impact you forever. So always remember to enjoy the path you take, even if it seems more challenging at the time. Because in the end, these obstacles and less traveled paths will be what shape you and impact you as you grow. And as a wise woman once said, ain't about how fast I get there, ain't about what's waiting on the other side, it's the climb. <laughs> now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Alex Trader. What's that sound? That is the sound of silence, at least superficially. If you listen closer, or in my case, drink my hearing aid. You can hear the clock take another minute out of existence. You can hear the drone of a plane passing overhead, the creak of the house settling up the winter wind, and the gentle whine of the computer fan. You can hear footsteps downstairs, heavy, often steps of a father, the quicker, lighter gait of a mother, pounding footfalls of an excited little brother racing up the staircase to say hello. Conversely, when you are simultaneously listening to an audiobook typing furiously in order to finish a Euro paper, you miss the same sounds. Under the silence lies a world of sound that we do not acknowledge. Under the dim lie soft noises, that's deep our ears. Too often in life, we miss the quiet sounds, which are sometimes more important than the loud ones. Too often, we call it this quiet silence. As students, we tend to diminish the importance of quiet things in life. We become too focused on the cacophony around us. We lead overloaded lives with education, jobs, and practices taking up the majority of our time. We tend to focus on numbers and end goals. Ironically, I can't remember now what grade I had on an English paper from Huckleberry Finn back in 10th grade, what I placed in number three at a Western <coughs> school. At the time, those numbers weren't important to me, but now what I remember is Mark Twain's dripping irony, the camaraderie with my friends at between events. I focused on the loud sound of the numbers in the moment. I did not appreciate the soft sound, the underlying experiences until later. In hindsight, the loud sounds of our life are not always as important as the quiet ones that we ignore. Silence can be nothing but something. Its simplicity is complex. If Alexander Fleming had dumped his moldy bacteria culture into the trash, he may not have discovered the penicillin. If Charles Goodyear ignored the black and rubber that fell onto his stove, tired may not exist as we know it. Two of the most influential discoveries in history may never have happened if Mr. Fleming and Mr. Goodyear had moved along with their work instead of giving the world around them a closer look. 
Our world needs people who are willing to see that nothing can be something. And so today I encourage you to step back from the clamor of life and appreciate the metaphors of quiet experiences and lessons that we gain along the way. There are quiet moments beneath the den, and rarely is the world truly silent. Thank you. As often is the case, let's begin with once upon a time. There was a girl who decided she wanted her speech to rhyme. So bear with me as the rest of this story is unveiled, and I'll tell you about the very first test I ever failed. As the minivan arrived at the local DMV, my confidence was eminent, anyone could see. I hadn't prepared at all, because who would have guessed that it was actually quite difficult, the elusive permit test. As I moved through the questions, it became quite clear that I may not pass. I didn't know cars had to be inspected every year. When I saw that final X, it was like a bullet to my pride. And I hate to admit it, but I actually laid down on the floor and cried. <laughs> this went on for probably half an hour or so before my mom finally dragged me up off the ground so we could go. The silliest part about it, much to my chagrin, is that I could literally go back the next day and take it again. I think there are a few things that can be learned from this story. For starters, it's really hard to rhyme the word story. <laughs> Second, it's smart to prepare, which is something I neglected. And third, I'll never forget how often to have my car inspected. <laughs> but most importantly, if you can take anything from this tale, it's that you absolutely, positively, should not be afraid to fail. I was devastated and embarrassed that I hadn't passed that test. But it all worked out fine, and I was a drama queen, I'll confess. Since that day, my list of failures has continued to increase. Tests, quizzes, student council events, any argument with Mr. P. <laughs> I've tried, I've failed, I've learned, and I've grown. And what I've come to find is that I've learned more from my failures than all of my successes combined. Failure teaches us to persevere. You learn what not to do, then you pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and start over if you have to. Without the failure, you'd never know the joy of the success. And besides, failure makes for much better stories, but I digress. So go out and try something new, and don't be afraid to fail. Audition for a play, take a harder class, and truly blaze your own trail. I promise you can achieve your goals, even if they're scary. All you need is persistence and the right tools, perhaps a rhyming dictionary. <laughs> so take it from me, the girl who pitched a fit at the DMV. Failure will hurt at first, but it will all work out, I guarantee. Don't be afraid to take risks, to put yourself out there and try something new. And by all means, if you want to write a speech that rhymes, then go for it. Thank you. to catch it before it went away. How many of you have actually made up your mind saying, that's it, I'm going to do it, and find out that you've achieved greatly from your great decision? It is true that people tend to stick with their old lives and hesitate to step forward to something new. When we must make a decision that potentially changes our whole life, of course we will consider all the pros and cons. Sometimes we just overstate the risks and step back as we feel satisfied with what we already have. I'm pretty sure that you all have confronted at least one major decision in which you have spent too many days and nights thinking about whether you should give it a try or not. In my case, the major decision was to leave my hometown in China, travel all the way across the Pacific Ocean, and instead study in Greensboro. I have to admit that I was not fully ready to study in America, physically or mentally. 
I didn't list all the pros and cons of studying abroad. I didn't check the weather here. Never expect that much snow in winter and that much heat in summer. I didn't search on Google the 10 tips you need to know before you study, uh, come to the United States. Apparently, I just made my decision without careful consideration. The only question lingering in my mind as I was about to make the decision was, do I want to try something new or do I just want to live the same way as my parents and stay in the same place for my life? I mean, I could, I could already see what would happen if I give up this opportunity and stay in China. I would, mostly, I would most likely to meet the same kind of people every day, embrace the same culture, and smell the same fluted air. Why not take a break and give a try to something new? So I decided to come here and be in a brand new environment with a bunch of strangers. To be honest, I was freaked out when I first got here, but later, when I made a lot of friends and spent a great time with our school faculty at GES, I realized it was the right choice. Every time I look back, the image of that impulsive, stupid little girl emerges in my mind. But I'm glad that she was hasty and, and never took a second thought to make a brave decision. Oh, I probably won't be standing here on the stage and sharing my life experience with you. So I encourage you all to take a step forward, challenge yourself, and try something new. You will be surprised by the outcomes of your brave decision. Thank you. There I sat, in the back of my father's car in my river, holding some five or six pennies. I was just six years old, and like many six-year-olds, I had a tendency to put small objects in my mouth. Almost inevitably, one small copper coin slowly made its way into my mouth, and it didn't take long for it to reach the back of my throat. Daddy, I must have said, I think I swallowed a penny. <laughs> we rushed to the urgent care facility, and I wondered to myself if I could reach for it and right my wrong. A series of x-rays proved what we already knew to be true. I had swallowed a penny, and there was really no way of retrieving it. I'm Jonas Crofton, I swallowed a penny, and I'm proud. <laughs> the story doesn't end there, unfortunately. You might think that I would have learned not to play with coins, or at least not to put them in my mouth, or at least not to swallow them once they were in my mouth. But just a year later, I sat in my basement, snacking pennies on my nose and cheeks, and before long, one of those very pennies slipped into my mouth, and I instinctively swallowed the little object. <laughs> one urgent care trip later, and I think I learned my lesson. Coins are not toys. The moral of my story isn't just a warning about the dangers of recreational pennies. <laughs> Rather, I encourage you to play with pennies. But if you happen to put them in your mouth and swallow them, do not make the same mistake twice. We all make mistakes, some more easily avoided than others, but that doesn't mean that we can't recover from them. People often get caught up in a bad test period or a poor performance in a sport match, but those individual failures don't define us. Take risks. As Ms. Frizzle said, have fun, make mistakes, and get messy. But learn from those mistakes. Don't continue to play with pennies after you've already swallowed one. Thank you. enthusiasm or desire for something. In high school and especially this year, I felt a lot of pressure to define and describe my passions. Almost every college I applied to asked some version of the question, what are you passionate about or what are your passions? I spent many nights trying to figure out the correct answers to these questions that would be truthful but won't offend admissions counselors who may dismiss me as passionless. I know that I'm passionate about certain things like food, sleep, and family. I was so passionate about sleep that I almost didn't make it to the ceremony today. 
I'm very passionate about cookout milkshakes, Maxi Beast Cake, TV shows like Gossip Girl in the Office, and I love to play soccer and tennis, but I hesitate to call any of these passions. Community service, school, clubs, and friends are important, but do they truly constitute a passion? However, I certainly know things that I'm not passionate about, like speaking in front of big groups of people. Um, high school students are expected to have a singular and easily defined passion that requires dedication and most of our time, and that defines us as people. I don't know about you, but that feels like a lot of pressure to me. Surely I like many things, but do I really want to focus on one thing to give it its proper place as my passion? I think that kids and young adults should be encouraged not to find a passion early, but to expand the world whenever possible. I think everyone's passion should be to find a strong emotion for trying new things, meeting new people, finding connections to others and places, and expanding their perspectives. In some ways, I encourage you all to be passionate about being passionless. And instead of finding one activity that requires complete dedication, try to push yourself out of your comfort zone by trying new things you've never done before. Sign up for a sport you've never played, take a class in an unfamiliar field, travel to another country, and talk to people you've never met. Don't limit yourself to one passion, but instead, pursue your passion for being passionless. Thank you. Oh, it's always so hard to get up and follow these guys. Let's give them another big round. You know, each year, when we have these incredible little poignant talks by our students, I, I take notes and probably see what they're writing, and I try to think, well, what's the theme and everything? And uh, uh, I, the one thing I came up with was risk takers and rhyme makers. <laughs> Uh, they are risk takers, they are rhyme makers, and we have the great pleasure of being with them each and every day uh, to um, join with them in the joy that they bring to Greensboro Day School each day. And we're just so very proud of you. Thank you each for your thoughtfulness and uh, the time and care that you put into your talks today. Thank you very much for that.